hello. Today we are with Sarah Glidewell and Emily Karnas, who are best friends and business partners from the Midwest who focus on off the beaten path Airbnbs and helping people like them achieve financial and time freedom through vacation rentals. Welcome to the show. Where I'm. Cool. I love, I love it. it. Oh my gosh. So I am so excited because I feel like we've kind of like crossed paths so many times, but never have actually gotten the time to like sit down and chat. So <laughs> this has been, I'm like so excited about this, but can you just tell everyone who were you two before the real estate investing, before the social media, before the business, all of it? <laughs> Conquer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Wow. Emily and I have been best friends for over 20 years. We were best friends since grade school. We played sports together, went to school together, have really gone through every phase of life together. Um, And so when it came time to starting a business, both Emily and I were in a phase of life that um, allowed us to do that. And so it was just such a natural progression for us to um, start a business together because we've worked in so many other capacities together our entire lives. So we knew that we were a good match in that way. Um, and, you know, we didn't know how long it was going to last, how long we were going to do it for, where we were going to go with this business. But now we're over four years in and it has just been uh, incredible uh, running a business with uh, my best friend and and getting to kind of go on that journey together. Uh, so. I love that. No, and it's funny too, because I actually do real estate with my best friend as well. And we've been doing it together for about a year and a half now. Um, but it's just one of those things where it's like their family, right? So, I, and it's so weird because it's, it's funny for me because there are some friends I lo- who are also family, love to death, would never work with them, right? <laughs> But then there are other friends like Anita. She's my best friend and she's both my business partner and she works for me in WWA, which is my coaching program. But it's just seamless, right? Like there's, it, it's a no brainer. <laughs> so I guess, how did you guys come to the point where you were like, okay, yeah, let's actually work together in that capacity. I think for us specifically, and it didn't necessarily start this way because honestly, we just kind of stumbled into doing business together when <laughs> um, like, a lot of people in the short-term rental industry, COVID hit and I couldn't get a job after graduating with my master's degree. And Sarah just needed to start another business to keep her properties afloat. So we stumbled into the business thing, kind of just trying to figure it out and have something to do. But the reason that we continued it is because Sarah and I are pretty much complete opposite personalities. So the Mm -hmm. things that we enjoy doing and have to do in our business don't overlap a lot. And so I think that That's kind of the thing with like, if you are starting a business with your best friend is sometimes your best friend is exactly the same as you. And I think that that probably is the case scenario where maybe it wouldn't work out to have a business with them. Because if a lot of your tasks overlap, then there's a whole thing over here that's not getting done because you're both focused on this one thing. And so I think that that is a benefit for both of us is that we have a little bit of overlap. Like we're both creative people and we like the aesthetic of everything and the design and stuff like that. But I'm more organizational and like getting systems in place. And Sarah's very much moving the needle forward, making relationships. And that like has how our business has been able to run really well together. At least that's how I feel about it. (laughs) Uh, I love that. No, and I feel that. So that's kind of like me and Anita. So it's like no one... I feel like unless you really follow me on Instagram and follow everything, then you like know who Anita is. But Anita hates social media, is not on it, like deleted it years ago. (laughs) Like she'll help me with the posting and stuff. That's the only time that she downloads it. But she's very much like, I'm behind the scenes operational. (laughs) And I'm like, not. I'm bad at tiny details. I'm the big visionary thinker. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I love that. So I guess what were you two doing before you started the business like work-wise? Yeah. I was gonna Go say ahead. I so I was working in retail. I've been working in retail since I was like 16 years old. And I went to school for nursing and then biology. And then I got into retail. So I had changed my major a bunch of times. I'm one of those people. And I'm also one of those people who my degrees are sitting in the envelopes that they were mailed to me in, in the back of the closet. <laughs> We even look at them. I guess now I'm kind of dabbling in that industry a little bit. And like, it, there was a little bit of marketing and business. So we'll say I use my degree to a certain extent. <laughs> I worked in retail for years and I wanted to start a fashion company. So when I graduated end of 2019, I got my master's degree in global retailing and I started applying for jobs. And then at that point, it was like, 
maybe COVID's going to shut the world down. Maybe they're not. So people weren't really hiring in those first couple months of the year even. And then they definitely weren't hiring after the world shut down. And so I um, tucked tail and I went back and got a serving job during that point in time. And I had told myself I'd I had this ego. I was like, oh my gosh, I have a master's degree. I'm never going back to serving. Oh my gosh. I'll go back to serving. And it's honestly just like the greatest money you can make and like a decent schedule. So I was like, okay, whatever. And so um, when we started the business, I was still serving. So I would serve my shifts and then I would go and do the design stuff that we were doing. Um, So that overlapped a little bit. And then eventually I left that because I was moving to Thailand, but I served for a little while. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's awesome. And it's so funny about the degree thing. Cause literally I, I have no idea where my degrees are. I think I like gave them to my parents for Christmas or something. Cause I was like, I'm not going to use these. So. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll throw mine away when uh, they're paid off. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, fair enough. Oh my gosh. So how about you, Sarah? Oh, that's the reality, isn't it? It's like, Oh, still having to pay for them afterward. It's <laughs> but Um, but I did not get my master's degree. I stopped at my bachelor's degree and I got my bachelor's degree in interior design. Um, and that's honestly what led both Emily and I to Texas. I Googled what state didn't have snow paid the most for interior designers and it was Texas. And so, um, Emily and I decided to move down there. I was like, Emily, I'm going to Texas to get these student loans paid off. And she's like, well, you're not leaving me in Michigan. Like I'm coming (laughs) with you. Um, And so we moved down there together. And while she was getting her master's, I was working at an architecture firm in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, designing really boring stuff like McDonald's, Starbucks, (laughs) like just nothing. I mean, it was fine, but it just wasn't what I thought, you know, getting going to an art school and getting a creative degree was going to lead me to. And so um, that's when all of a sudden the wheels started turning of like, okay, this is fine for now, but there's gotta be something else yeah, out there for no, us. No, for sure. And so you guys, did you start with the interior? You, so I know a little bit about both of your stories, but I know Sarah, you had like the arbitrage situation going on. Okay. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. So while Emily was still in school, I started dabbling in arbitrage. My husband and I were traveling a lot. And whenever we would travel, we would just lock our closet with all of our belongings in it. And we would rent our apartment out on Airbnb. Um, And at the time, it was just like, let's see if we can, you know, pay for our travel. Like, let's just use this as a little side hustle. Um, And it just would book immediately. Like we would post it on a Friday morning when we would have decided last minute to like catch a flight Friday night. And before our flight was taking off Friday night, like we would already have a booking for that weekend. And so we were like, wait a minute, like this aha, uh-huh, like magic moment with Airbnb where you're like, holy crap, time out. Like this is making me rethink everything. Um, and so at that point in time, I had finished paying my student loan debt and I had just kept that same, like what I was putting towards my student loans, I had just started saving and putting away um, for an investment at some point in time. And so in that moment, I was like, okay, this Airbnb thing, like there's more to it. I'm going to take all the money I have saved and I'm going to pour it into a few arbitrage properties in Dallas, Texas. Um, And so that's what I did. And Emily helped me design them, install them. We were both so excited to like watch these Airbnbs perform. Um, And I launched them live on Airbnb March of 2020. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy, not fun. (laughs) It was was super unfortunate timing. But at that point in time, like Emily was out of job and now I was on the hook for several rents that I wasn't prepared to pay for if there was no traffic coming to the properties. And so Emily and I had this crazy idea that like, okay, we can see other investors are still investing. We're listening to podcasts that are local to DFW and everyone's saying like, landlords, like this is the time to really, you know, hone in on landlords who otherwise would be telling you no for arbitrage. Um, And so we were like, wait a minute, like, let's see if we can design for other investors who know what they're doing, who are in a better situation than we are in. Um, And let's see if we can't learn while making a little bit of money to kind of, you know, make up for the fact that my properties were no longer making the money that I thought they were going to. And so we started a second business to save my first business and then, 
here we are oh four my gosh, years I later. Okay, there's so many things I want to touch on. Number one is like the fact that you, you know, packed up all your belongings and just like rented your place out. Cause that's what I do as well. And I still do that to this day, right? Cause it's a no brainer. I'm like, why would you not rent out your place while you're traveling? You're not going to be there anyways. Might as well give it to someone else and make some money on top of it. <laughs> Pays for everything. Right. Um, but then the other thing that I really wanted, cause something that I really appreciate about both of you is that you guys are so public with your failures, right? Like, and I, they're not really failures, right? They're really just like, attempts of like, that's all like, honestly, real estate investing entrepreneurship is all just attempting things and trying things out, seeing what works, what doesn't work being like, oopsies, that didn't work. Move on to the next thing. Right. <laughs> but I love how just like forward and public you guys are about it because so many people just show the highlights. And I think like that's social media, right? Like we're so accustomed to showing the highlights, but there's so much that goes on in the back end. So I guess, how did you guys even feel comfortable like sharing those that from the beginning. And yeah, like, I feel like your general brand is just like, so fueled by authenticity. So how did you kind of like do that? <laughs> yeah, I, well, one social media for us, we started not thinking that it was going to be a business. Honestly, mm -hmm. it was just fun for us to document it. Like we're best friends working together. So it was really fun to just film while we were there and document the portfolio that we were helping other people grow, but we have this design portfolio. And so really that's what it started as. But I think to say that we like we show our failures, we just noticed that not a lot of people were doing that. And we were like, there's a lot of failures that happen. We make a lot yeah. of mistakes. <laughs> and, and like some of them are can be pretty bad. And I was like, okay, nobody's talking about this. And so we noticed that that wasn't happening. And we've always been big on like either creating the room or just like being open and making sure that like everybody feels comfortable in that environment because there's not a lot of people doing it. And so I think that naturally we just were like, you know what, we're just going to show people if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. And <laughs> we'll, we'll get the right people in our room. <laughs> Completely. Oh my gosh. So I guess what made you transition from like, cause you guys don't do interior design anymore, right? You just design your own properties. What made you transition? <laughs> I trust me, I get it. As someone who has an interior design business, I'm like, we're very minimal projects. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not that we didn't like it. Um, but at the time, one, when we did have clients that were rolling in um, and they were starting to speed up, what we noticed is we just, at the time, didn't have a skill set to really build that out in a way that we could remove ourselves from that interior design business. And so it was taking up 100% of our time and we were making more money on the properties that we would set up once for ourselves and then, you know, let run forevermore. And so it was like 20% of our time was spent on the thing that was making 80% of yeah. our income. And so we were like, look, we really need to understand how this investment thing works on a larger scale because the interior design thing, it's all working income and it's only yeah. one time payout, right? It's not something that's going to pay us out over and over and over again. And so we were like, look, this was our like a wonderful first rendition of stepping into, you know, being an entrepreneur and trying to understand how to work with clients and how to price yourself and how to negotiate and all of these skills. But it wasn't something, it wasn't a business model that we were like stoked yeah. to continue growing. And so we were like, how quickly can we set this down and what are we going to replace it with? And so um, when we, you know, got an offer from a real estate fund to kind of handling, handle their marketing component of that fund, we were like, look, we don't know if this is it or if it's not it. Um, but we know that the interior design thing is not something we want to grow. So we're ready to step away from that. And at that point in time, we were like, okay. We're only designing for properties that we either own 100% of or own yeah, a portion Yeah, no, I of. very much feel that. And that's what Anita and I kind of like came to the decision earlier this year. We're like, we're, we take on one project a quarter. That is it. And it's more just for fun. Like literally, it's because my creative brain likes to do things. And I'm, I, I, it's so funny because when I'm in the you know weeds of either real estate or my coaching business, sometimes it can become a lot. So like the interior design is now just a fun, like it's like painting almost for me now because it's not a job anymore. It's just a fun like side project. <laughs> right. Right. And now that we're a little further along too, I think that like now looking back on it, once we are really proficient at hiring people yes. and training other people and outsourcing and things like that, like I wouldn't be opposed to coming back to that and offering that again because we understand the design side of this business so mm -hmm. intimately and it's such an important part of the business. 
Uh, but we're just not there yet. So we're like, okay, you know, that, that worked <laughs> for a minute and then it didn't work work again so we'll keep it on the back no for, for sure now. and even like the you know the interior designers that i really admire like they've got some kick-ass teams you know <laughs> and that is key. and that's the key of business in general i think that's the beauty about entrepreneurship is you can hire right like you can build a team to help do help you do everything pretty much and essentially fire yourself from the business which is kind of nice <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So you went from interior design to managing the marketing side of this fund. Then what happened? How did you get your properties? Where are you now? (laughs) Yeah, we, um, so we worked for them for, I guess about seven months and we just kind of realized that we were building a brand that wasn't ours. And that was like the main reason why we decided to part ways with them. We were like, this is great. Like it's successful, whatever, but we wanted to build the car wells and we didn't want to build somebody else's brand. And so we separated from them and I took a little bit of a hiatus. Um, and Sarah actually got a, um, capital raising deal that she started taking on. And we, I ended up purchasing a property a couple months later. So my hiatus was like, not an actual hiatus. <laughs> I was like, I need a break. And then I was like, mm, never mind. I have too much time on my hands. Um, but so yeah, we just continued investing in Michigan. Um, we had kind of looked in that market already because that's where we're from. We know the Michigan market best. And so we took everything that we learned because while we were helping run the marketing side, we were joining all the meetings of the analysis and figuring out how this company worked and how you're able to use other people's money to invest in deals and things like that. And so we took all of the knowledge that we were able to gain from that. And we just put it into a market that all of these big businesses and big companies are not willing to go into the market that we're in because there's not a lot of data to back it. And so that's kind of what we were able to do to set ourselves apart. And so now we invest in off the beaten path markets in Michigan. No, I love that. And this is what I tell people all the time is because everyone wants to know where's the best place to invest. And it's like, what places, what areas do you know of, right? Like what areas do you maybe like, did you go vacation at when you were younger and things like that? Because those are going to be the real gems, especially in today's market where like places like the Smokies are oversaturated. Oversaturated is not the right word, but the competition is high, right? Mm -hmm. So like, especially if you don't have a hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank, you may need to pivot your strategy a little bit, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. More. And the markets that we're in are so great for first-time investors. Like for us, we decided to invest in Michigan. I mean, one, we're from here, right? So we understand what people like in Michigan. So we had that edge going for us right at the gate. But also the Midwest is one of, if not the least, most inexpensive market to invest in. And so we can get waterfront property for you know, well under a half a million dollars. And that's just not heard of in most other markets. And so we were looking at it and we were looking at the level of competition, which was super low, the price tag to actually play competitively in these markets and the fact that we already knew um, quite a bit about what Michigan people liked. And so it was just the path of least resistance for us. But I totally agree with you that like people really get hung up on like, I have to be in a specific market or it's not going to work. And you know, X, Y, and Z markets, or or since nobody's doing it, it must not be a thing. Um, and that's not the case at all, right? Like you, you build it and people will come, especially if it's a quality experience. And so we've just kind of hung our hats on that um, and entering in these markets that just don't have a whole lot of data to support the numbers that yeah, we're Yeah, so pulling. I guess how did you, since it didn't have the data initially, how did you feel comfortable jumping in? Like what data did you use? Or did you use any data when you first got in? <laughs> Right. Uh, full transparency. No, <laughs> I, I did not. I didn't know what air DNA was when I purchased our, the first lake house that, um, it was a part of our portfolio in 2021. Um, I didn't know anything about interest rates. I didn't know anything about air DNA. I didn't know anything other than how to look on Airbnb and, and see that other people, you know, had Airbnbs in the area that had been operating for several years. And so I could see what they were charging. I could see how far they were booked out. I could obviously see their listing and their photos. Um, And so I could make an assumption on like, okay, if these people have been operating for several years, they've got to be making money, right? Like they've got to be ROI positive for them to have reviews for the last three or four years on Airbnb. And it looks like grandma and grandpa's (laughs) house. And there are 
There were no amenities. There is no professional photography. There's no murals. There's no neon sign. There's no coffee bar. There's no, like there's mismatched quilts. There's like taxidermy on every single wall. Like it just, it wasn't the vibe that we had seen excel in markets that were higher, you know, having higher competition. And so all I thought at that point in time is I was like, if these people have been making money for a really long time, doing it the way that they're doing it, what would happen if I came in and did it the way that Emily and I have seen it work in more saturated markets? And so at that point in time, that was all I had to go off of. And I was just like, look, we're just going to go all in on this because it can't be any worse <laughs> than long re-arbitrage properties with COVID oh hitting the gosh. next day. Like we no, I love that. And uh, honestly, so I feel like the issue, honestly, today is that there's almost too much data out there, right? And like, I genuinely do think ignorance is bliss sometimes because otherwise people will get into that analysis paralysis and they're like, well, there's this, it's kind of like in the dating market, right? Like there's almost too many, like it's too easy <laughs> like there's too much data out there that everyone's always thinking that they're missing out because people are doing this and people are doing that. So it's like, I almost tell people at the beginning, it's like, just get your first property. Like ideally get something that's not going to lose money, but it doesn't have to be a slam dunk home run deal. Just get started. Right. And then you start to create your processes and systems because sometimes too, people buy their first property and they're like, okay, wait, actually I hate this. And now you've like spent all this time, <laughs> you know, worrying about something that you don't even like. So it's like, get started, get a property first, see if you like it and then dive like full in, go for it. You know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, we I feel like we get this question all the time where it's that same thing. Like, where do I invest? Where's the best place for me to invest? Because they're like, I love vacationing in Florida. So should I invest there? It looks like people invest there. And I'm like, can you afford that? Like, there's so many other questions to ask about that. But it's like, just pick one. Like you just pick it. And then you're like, okay, can I afford this? No, I can't afford it. Okay, let's go. Let's move on. It has to be like these quick decisions. And that's, I think kind of what helped us a little bit is that like, we just made a quick decision and we were like, okay, this is it. Like we're going here and we're diving in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. Y'all do I have something exciting for you? Now I just came out with a brand new free training on exactly how you, yes, you can get started investing in real estate within the next three months. Because if you're someone who wants more freedom in your life, the ability to travel the world and do the things that you actually want to do in life, you're going to want to listen up. Trust me. Now, this training is freaking awesome. I literally go in and spill the tea on the number one strategy that is working right now, like literally today in today's market. And I go over how to look at deals and make sure that they actually cash flow and how to set your properties up so that you can run them from anywhere in the world. Like I literally have managed my properties from over six different time zones. So if you are stuck in analysis paralysis, you don't know where to start when it comes to real estate investing, but you know that it's something that you want to do in the future, this training is going to be for you. So to check it out, click the link in the show notes or DM me the word hack, like H-A-C-K on Instagram, and I will send you the link. Now let's dive back into the show. And so... Um, something that, so I know that you, Emily, now you are a new mom, which is wonderful. So how has been just like navigating business and just the partnership as well as a new mom? Uh, we, and I, I so asked this like super selfishly because my business partner, she's like been married for five years, planning on probably trying for kids starting next year. And I'm like already like thinking and planning ahead, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, we are still kind of figuring that out, if I'm being completely honest. Um, we, I just haven't like learned how to judge what my capacity is. And so I think Sarah are, and I are having what we're calling slow girl summer. Yes. Um, we need to trademark that because we keep saying it. And people like, I love that. Um, but so I didn't really take a break after I had my son. And so I think figuring out what our business relationship and what my personal investing journey needs to look like is still kind of a work in progress. If I'm being honest, he's about to be six months old. So I kind of need to figure it out. <laughs> I was just putting like he needs more and more of my attention. Yeah. Um, but I think that that is one of the additional benefits of also having your best friend as your business partner, because Sarah and I always prioritize our friendship and each other's happiness before our business. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't want to say that a normal business partner wouldn't do that, but you can't guarantee that. And so yeah. um, I'm just lucky enough that like, if I tell Sarah, sorry, I need a break today. I'm exhausted. He didn't sleep last night. She can pretty much 
understand that. She'll be like, please take a break. Like you don't need to be taking on it more than you need to. Um, but it's a, it's a work in progress. I mean, like some days I get a ton done and I feel like I've gotten the world accomplished. And then there are days where literally I lay on the couch with them all day because I can't get them to stop crying. And yeah. that is the huge benefit of being an entrepreneur. I think that there are positives and negatives. Like I don't get my break because I'm with him all day and trying to get my work done all day. But there's also the fact that I can be like, you know what? Sorry, I can't. Yeah. I can't do it today. I've got to just take care of my son. So there are, it, we're learning balance. So when I figure it out, maybe it'll be when he's 18. I'll let you know. <laughs> no, I mean, but that's so real. And I, I even think about, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I went to Nicaragua for a week. And originally I was planning on like bringing my computer and still doing things on the side. But I was starting to feel so burnt out. And I literally texted Anita and was just like, I think I need to clear everything. <laughs> like I was, and I literally that day, like, and she was like, yes, clear everything. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, just cleared everything. She took over absolutely everything after that. And I just like got to have my break, but that is the beauty of like working with someone you're so close to. Cause you really do prioritize like your health, your friendship, your life before the business. And like, obviously the business is important because it pays your bills, but at the end of the day, if you're not like healthy and happy internally, like how can you be there for your business too, you know? Yeah. And we also are learning the process of hiring currently. Um, <laughs> up until now, it has literally been Sarah and I doing everything. Not even a VA? Not even a VA. Oh my gosh, gosh girls. <laughs> we're just out of our own word. And let me tell you, um, it was, and I've said this before, but it was a big wake up call being in labor and sending emails. Like, oh that was my gosh, that something is that I needed wild. to be doing. And it's not even that like Sarah can't pick up and help. Like she absolutely is capable of doing that. It's just that we are so locked into our roles and I have everything set up to where I know how to do it. Yeah. And I don't, necessarily know how to tell Sarah how to do it because I've set it up for me and she set up her stuff for her. So, um, and we're very good at like running in our roles because mm -hmm. we are, we're uh, those opposite personalities. And so we're learning what that looks like and we are currently in the hiring process. So hopefully I'm able to pull back a little bit from, it's a lot of back end tasks that maybe don't necessarily like move the business forward, but they keep the business running. And that's oh, yeah. the kind of thing that we need like somebody to take over. So I think both of us will have a lot more balance when we are able to hire that out. So that is a full transparency thing we're bad at with entrepreneurship is the hiring. Process. Oh, I mean, that's so fair though. Cause I took forever to hire my first VA as well. And then I hired a copywriter and then I was like, I remember when I first got my VA, I was like, wow, my brain has time to think. <laughs> <laughs> literally just it's like all the silly little tiny time and it also forced me to like be really good about my SOP so that anyone could do it and now I even have her right like sometimes I'll record a loom video but I have her write the SOP because just in case she goes to have a baby or whatever happens I'm like this needs to be so that anyone can come in and fill the role and do the tasks <laughs> exactly. oh my gosh I guess why did it take you so long to hire <laughs> oh. um i mean i think wow like one we've we've changed what yeah. we're doing in a short-term rental space about a gazillion and a half times right like we were interior designers then we were marketers for a fund then we were mentors then we're hosting retreats then we're building our own portfolio then we're raising capital and so i feel like emily and i have gone through this four-year period of like tasting a lot um, but not having a very clear, identifiable role mm -hmm. to hand off, right? Both of our roles have changed so rapidly. Um, and so now we're just at a point where we're like, we're very settled in the fact that we want to continue offering mentorship. We want to continue building the online brand and our community. And so now it's like, okay, we're at an obvious point where Emily is starting to have repeat work over and over and over again that a VA could easily do, but that's yeah. new to us, you know? them switching so much. So I feel like it's just out of like us not wanting to bring someone on and then realize like 12 seconds later that we no longer need them to do that thing and we're running in a different direction. And so now that we feel like, okay, we, we've we got our feet kind of set in a certain place, at least in one portion of our business, now we can bring someone on and feel confident that you know it's worth training them, 
to do this thing that we know we're going to be okay, doing that long-term. is actually very fair because I think that's kind of where we were at last year as well. It's like, we were just kept pivoting. We're like, well, we're going to try this. And like, do we like this? I don't know. Like, let's do the next thing, <laughs> you know, whereas like I knew with my coaching program, I knew with the real estate side of things, I was like, these are staying, these are here to stay. Everything else I don't really know right now. <laughs> Okay. Which is great. It's a blast yeah. figuring it out, but it just reaches a point where we're like, okay, we're carrying way more than a normal person yeah. should be carrying. So let's get help Oh in my here. gosh. So I guess out of curiosity too. So for anyone who's thinking of maybe they want to go invest in the Midwest, like what do, and I guess it's going to be different right now because, you know, interest rates are different right now, but like, what are your general numbers looking like on a property? Yeah, Absolutely. So our specialty tends to be middle of nowhere lake houses. <laughs> like we have Orange Cadillac, which is our one off, not lakefront property that's monstrous, right? But all four of the other properties are waterfront properties here in Michigan. Um, the buy box for those properties has been anywhere from 250000 up to $350,000. So, Great. you know, in that range. Um, all under 2,000 square foot. So anywhere from, you know, 1,100 up to maybe 16 or 1,700 square foot. Um, and those properties, you know, all said and done, if we're putting 20% down on them, we're usually spending around maybe $150,000 all in on the property between down payment, closing costs, supplies, all the things. Um, and these properties all are pulling in over six oh, figures a year. That is revenue. so good. <laughs> So freaking good, especially like under 400. Oh my gosh, that is a steal. Oh my, I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, it's a big reason why we think people are so interested in Mm -hmm. our our mentorship that we're offering because even with the higher interest rates, because the house prices are so low here in the Midwest, deals still pencil left and right, you know? So it's like, they're not as good of a deal as what the house was that I purchased in 2021 at a 3.2% interest rate, but that's unreasonably good, Totally, you know? like So still people are purchasing properties and moving forward, even with higher interest rates here because it still makes sense. No, I love that. I know that's like, um, my first property that I purchased was a duplex in New Orleans and it does like insanely well, like up to 10K a month, but... I have a 2.75% interest rate on it, you know? So it does even better, you know? But the thing is like, there are still properties that work out there. You just kind of have to find those middle of nowhere markets, honestly, especially if you are going to go the STR route, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. uh, So I guess, what would you say are traits that both of you admire or like, is there anyone who either in real estate or just in entrepreneurship that you do admire? Oh, so many. <laughs> okay, let's let's go let's go in entrepreneurship. <laughs> so not not real estate investors. <laughs> First and foremost, my best friend Emily. <laughs> <I admire. laughs> um, wow. In entrepreneurship in general, um, I'm gonna say an obvious one, but I've just been on a huge yes. Cody Sanchez kick. Um Which I just, I appreciate her content so much because I feel like it's no BS. Um, And she's just like really raw and real with the stuff that she puts out. Um, And you can tell that she's like internally meant to be an entrepreneur, right? Like I hate the narrative that like anybody can be an entrepreneur because you get (laughs) to do it. Like you have days that you feel like you're just taking bows to the face, you know, over and over and over again. Uh, But there is a specific type of person that is like perfectly meant to be in this arena. Um, and so I think I see a lot of myself and Emily in Cody Sanchez. And so when I see her like preaching, I'm like, yes, like you get it. I get it. We're, we're in this together. We're not alone. So I just found a ton of value. In oh her my content. gosh. I know. I Have you listened to her new podcast? I love her new podcast. It is so good. But yeah, and she says it's it's interesting because like, you know, you've got Cody Sanchez and you've got like Alex Hormozzi and Layla Hormozzi. And I feel like for whatever reason, I do just kind of like relate a little better to Cody than Alex and Layla, just because I just think like there's just a different balance. I don't even know entirely what it is, <laughs> but I just feel like there's a different balance where it's like, I actually, I do know what it is. I think like Alex and Layla very much preach like work, 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 like no boundaries, no balance. And I'm like, that is not how I function. <laughs> I'm like, I need yeah. to ebb and flow. I need my breaks. I set up big systems so that I can take breaks. Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, that's exactly it too. I couldn't agree more. It's like Alex and Layla give me a little bit like yeah. robotic vibes. <laughs> like they're just being the grind and that's what they love and they want to do nothing else. And I'm like, no, we're building this because there are so many other things that we love outside of work that we want to spend exactly. more time doing. And so it is a balance. Like, I, yeah, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> so I guess what made you guys decide on short-term rentals specifically versus other like going into long-term rentals or going into medium-term rentals, like especially when the arbitrage stuff didn't work out that first time, like was there ever any part of you that thought about pivoting? Not for short-term rentals, no. Honestly, real estate investing in general, I don't think would have sparked any sort of passion in Emily and I at all if it didn't have the creative side, the fun side, the sexy side that short-term rentals has. So I know a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, tried and true, like multifamily is the way to go or, you know, like there's less regulations or less drama and any other form of real estate investing outside of short term rentals. And um, but I always say this like in a kind of joking way, like I need the drama in my life. <laughs> I, I like fighting those battles. Like I like that that interesting twist that short term rentals brings to it. And Emily and I both, even though we are you know, opposite in the corners of, of the business that we enjoy doing, both of us are true yeah. creatives. And so it has to have that creative side of that guest experience, that hospitality layer for us to, you know, feel passionate about it because I don't like, I don't want to be a true long term rental <laughs> landlord. That's not- <laughs> No, I feel that so hard. I remember because like, I remember when I was first getting started, I was listening to all the bigger pocket stuff and there were like long-term rentals and multifamily. And it just like bore me to tears. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want to create something fun. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, like, I just, I want Emily and I to be working on things that exactly. like light us up. Right. Um, and a long-term rental just isn't, isn't going to scratch that itch. <laughs> I love that. And so another thing too, about both of you is, you guys have kind of shifted your whole community to be surrounded by short-term rentals consistently. So I guess, can you tell me a little bit about that and why you made the shift and how that's affected your life? Yeah, we, I mean, we just have like all of our friends that we're like going around with that are short-term rental hosts now. And I think part of that, and Sarah said this the other night when we were talking to somebody and I thought it was a really good way to put it, is it's part of what makes our job fun is that like now we are also friends with the people we get to work with. And every time we get to go on a trip, it just so happens to be that it's like some of our best friends that get to go with us as well. Um, And we're just very much so in a stage of loving what we do. And so it's what we want to talk about all the time. And we have great friends from back home, but they don't want to talk short-term rentals all the time. They're like, can you please shut up about your job once in a while? (laughs) we're, We're just in a stage of loving what we do. And so we want to talk about it. And so We just surrounded ourselves with friends that are kind of have the same mindset and the same idea of what investing looks like for them because there's all different kinds of investors in this industry and everybody's successful in their own way. But we've just found the people that like to invest the same way that we do. And then we started the mentorship and have become friends with a lot of the people who have come through our mentorship because they also have the same mindset around it and the love for it. And so it's our community just community is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's fine with us. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love that. And it's so funny too, because like I literally have done kind of the same thing where, so I used to live in New Orleans. I picked up my stuff and literally just started driving and ended up here in Denver. (laughs) Um, because I knew that number one, I have an amazing, well, so I went to grad school in Denver. So I've got like both friends from home or like not from home, but from grad school from before. Then I've also got so many real estate investor friends here, both in the short-term rentals place, flippers all over the board because it's Denver. Um, And then there's so many just like entrepreneurs here. Like, so I'm very much trying to not just be in the real estate space, but also be around other like online coaches and, you know, other other entrepreneurial ventures. So I even joined this bougie entrepreneurship membership club here in Denver that I'm super stoked about. (laughs) Um, But it's just like so important to surround yourself with other people who are doing the thing that you want to do, who are have big goals and visions like you do so that it can keep expanding your mind as well. And like, this is what I tell literally everyone, like all of my students too. It's like, start going to meetups, start just getting in more rooms because it's so important and it's going to completely shape your whole experience. (laughs) It really does. I oh. 
sorry, Sarah, to interrupt you. I was just going to say, I went to a meeting today because a friend of ours who has a permanent jewelry business, she started going to this entrepreneurial women's meeting once a month. And it happened to be that one of the girls who went through our mentorship runs it. And it's all people from different industries, the wedding industry, home loans, short-term rentals, all the real estate agent stuff. And it was so nice just talking and helping each other problem solve and something that's nothing related to what I'm doing, but we're all just talking about moving our business forward and helping each other solve problems. And so there's definitely something to be said that it doesn't even have to be in your industry. Just put yourself yep. in a room with other people that are also trying to build a business and you can help each other out. So I like that you said that because it it isn't just about being in a room with short-term rental people. Yeah. And I think too, like Emily and I, you know, there was this just huge narrative when we got into being entrepreneurs that it was going to mm-hmm. be lonely. And like Emily and I were like, uh, like I do not do well alone. <laughs> Social butterfly. I'm like loved having coworkers, like loved going into the office. And so it was just very natural for Emily and I to kind of reach out in that way and try and find community. Um, but now, especially like now that we're in the thick of running our business and you know, the the fires are nonstop and like the winds are happening just as fast as the losses are happening, and there's just like a lot going on all the time. And I will just feel so exhausted sometimes or burnt out or frustrated or pigeonholed or corner or like whatever the case may be. And every single time I lean into my community that I've built in entrepreneurship, and that's always been my out. That's always been my green light. That's always been the thing that has either carried me through or or given me the idea on how to get out of the situation or whatever the case may be. And so without developing that community, like I don't think Emily and I would still be doing the thing that we're doing without the people that we've surrounded ourselves with. So Community is arguably the most important portion of being an entrepreneur. I love that. No, that is so freaking true. Okay, well, so we are coming up to the last three final questions that I ask every single person who comes on the Wonderless Wealth Show. So number one for both of you, and either one can go first, is what does your ideal perfect day look like? (laughs) You know, I... I can tell you parts of what my perfect day looks like. Yes, it's perfect. (laughs) Um, I don't exactly know what that looks like yet, but um, I actually found out recently I love waking up early, so I probably would want to wake up at 7. I've been going actually to a 6 a.m. yoga class. So I want to start the day with some sort of calming physical activity. I'm not trying to run or lift weights. Um, (laughs) I like getting my work done in the first half of the day. So if Mm -hmm. I can get all of my... Go to the my morning yoga get my work done before noon. And then honestly, read a book, go on a walk and watch a movie with my son, my husband and my animals. And that is my perfect day. Oh, I love that. That's fabulous. <laughs> oh, I'm happy though. So so <laughs> Literally, if I had to guess what your perfect day was, that was... Absolutely <laughs> Mine is like the opposite. I'm like, I want absolutely no work. I want all of my friends around and yeah, I want to go I to a new place. Too. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I just want to be doing new things with uh, people that I love. And that would uh, be a win for me. And it has to be uh, sunny. Like as long as... I mean, I'm that is literally mood. why I moved to Colorado. 300 days of sun, baby. <laughs> So oh my hard. gosh. I, and it's always so funny. I know that question always catches everyone off guard because they're expecting some sort of like real estate <laughs> question. I love that question. Um, question number two. So what is your mantra? Or And it doesn't have to be like, oh, this is my mantra, but like something that you tell yourself over and over again. The phrase I repeat most frequently is figure it out. Yes. <laughs> That's I love I'm in that. a figure it out kind of era. And that goes with new motherhood. It goes with being a wife. It goes with working anything. Like now that we're hiring and we've never hired before, I'm like, figure it out. You're just going to have to figure out what that process looks like. So <laughs> figure it out right now in, in this current stage of life. That's my mom. Have you ever read Everything is Figure Outable by Marie Forleo? No, but I love book recommendations. It's, so, yeah, it's yeah. so good. It is required reading for all of my students. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? That's amazing. I could have guessed that Emily was going to say that too, because we have said that back and forth about a <laughs> billion times. You haven't heard this before. Um, my current mantra, and this is in the spirit of me practicing more discipline in several areas of my life, 
Um, right now would have to be this is going to oh, make you better. I love that. I love that. That's so um, good. <laughs> Yeah, because with this, like this year, I really wanted to take a more holistic approach. Like I wanted to focus on my health, my strength, my relationship and my business. Because the last, like Emily's mentioned several times, like the last four years, we have just been heads down, the two of us just Mm -hmm. hustling, which has been an absolute blast. But like, nonetheless, it's not sustainable long term. And so I think that like that phase of our business was necessary. But now we're like, okay, how do we get this like back into a healthier place? Um, and with that, it's like this year, we've had a lot of crazy situations come up with our B and B's in regards to like regulation and, you know, just all sorts of stuff. And so every single time I'm in a situation I don't want to be in where I feel like a little bit of entitlement now being like, well, I created this portfolio that was supposed to like replace my nine to five income and I'm supposed to be chilling a little bit more than I have been in the past. And I have to like really buckle down and go to work. I'm like, this is making me better. Like this is preparing me for something greater. And I just have to appreciate that as opposed to fighting it. That's amazing. Okay. Last question. What does wealth mean to you? (laughs) These questions are so good. I I always, I've always considered just like sending them to people beforehand, but I like the, like the spontaneity during the. (laughs) Yes. Um, I think wealth to me, honestly, means my version Mm -hmm. of balance. Um, I think that it's very easy for all of us that are in, you know, the entrepreneurial space to get very, very much caught up in the game of comparison or the, you know, hamster wheel of more, more, more. Um, And so if we can like define exactly what a healthy balance is and what our end goal is, that's wealth to me. Like I want as many hours with my husband as possible, as opposed to as many dollars as I possibly can get in my bank account. Um, And so wealth is just feeling like I have control over my hours in a day. I love that. Uh, Yeah, mine's probably similar. I also just always want the ability to like give back, whether it's like to my community, to the world, anything like that. Like I want to be able to leave an impact. And so if that means that like I have everything of my own taken care of, so then I get to go and spend my time making the world a better place. I am very happy to do that. I I don't think I would ever get to a point in my life where I would want to stop working completely because I get bored pretty quick. Me too. Um, And so (laughs) if I get to have my, my personal life figured out to where I don't have to like plug into work every day and I just get to make the world a better place. I would, I would love that. Ugh, I love that. This has been so freaking fabulous. Where can people reach out to both you, Emily and Sarah? I think you guys have a joint account. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are the Carwells on all platforms. Um, probably the most active in Instagram DMs. So that's where you can reach out. We do tip Tuesday, every single Tuesday. So if you have short term rental specific questions, please put them on tip Tuesday. I love it. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you. This is so fabulous. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for having us. This has been great. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to Wonderless Wealth Show. Now, don't forget to follow the podcast or if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you love this episode, it would literally mean the world to me if you shared this with a friend or a family member or literally like anyone off of the street. (laughs) Like right now, go ahead, share it so you don't forget or post it on social media and make sure to tag me. I love seeing what you're listening in on and what you resonated with. And I'm just so freaking thankful for you. I'm so freaking excited for you. I love you. And don't forget, life really doesn't have to be hard.